in order to be good custodians of our planet. We really need to understand how it's changing. How is it evolving? I'm Shannon Statham, and here at NASA JPL, I help prepare Sentinel-6 for its journey to space. And here we are at High Bay 2. This is actually a clean room, and each component gets tested on its own, and then we assemble it together. Sentinel-6 is a continuation of ocean observation missions that NASA has actually been doing since the early 90s, and it's specifically capturing the height of the ocean as it flies over. We really need that long duration observation so that we can better predict what is the rate of change, what is it gonna look like in a year, five years, 10 years from now, and so forth. So my team was responsible for assembling, testing, and delivering uh, AMRC for the Sentinel-6 mission and this is where we built it. AMRC is the Advanced Microwave Radiometer, one of a suite of instruments that work together on Sentinel-6 and then give us the very high resolution heights of the oceans. So we are in the antenna range at JPL, and this is where we tested AMRC. We need to know that what we send into space is going to survive. I've always had an affinity for arts, singing and dancing, and so one of the things I've been doing more recently is sewing and my dress I actually sewed. You cannot do this job without being creative. Every mission is unique. We are answering those really interesting and hard questions that we all have about our universe and our planet. Hi, I'm Raquel Villanueva with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. You may know NASA best for exploring other planets, but we are also keeping a close eye on our own planet Earth. NASA is about to launch the US and European Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite. This satellite aims to collect the most accurate data yet on sea level and how it changes over time. JPL manages the mission for NASA. Shannon Statham is an engineer who led a team that developed one of the instruments on the satellite. She joins us live today to answer some of your questions. Now, if you have a question you'd like to ask, leave them right here in the comments or post them to social media with the hashtag seeing the seas. Thank you so much for joining us today, Shannon. Thank you, Raquel. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about Sentinel-6 and answer some questions. That's great, let's get started. On the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich, your team was responsible for the advanced microwave radiometer. Can you tell us how your instrument contributes to the mission? Yes, absolutely. Well, first off, Sentinel-6 is an Earth science mission that will precisely measure the heights of our oceans. And it is a continuation of ocean observation missions that NASA actually started in the early 90s so Sentinel-6 will continue that record for the next decade. And my team was responsible for assembling and testing AMRC, or the Advanced Microwave Radiometer for Climate, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful and why we love our acronyms at NASA and JPL. Uh, but AMRC is specifically measuring water vapor or moisture in the atmosphere. So think clouds and rain and snow. And that data, along with the data from the other science instruments on Sentinel-6, is how we're able to resolve those very precise sea level heights. And you worked on other missions before Sentinel-6 here at JPL. Did you encounter any new challenges working on this satellite? Absolutely. Um, well, you know, every mission that we do at JPL and NASA is unique because we are always trying to push the envelope in pursuit of scientific discovery. So every mission is going to have its own challenges. And even though Sentinel-6 has this legacy of missions that come before it, we are utilizing new technologies and advancements in modeling techniques and other tools and processes to get us even better data than the predecessors of Sentinel-6. For example, AMRC is the next generation of microwave radiometers developed at JPL. Every mission prior to Sentinel-6 for ocean observations has had some microwave radiometer on board to measure water vapor in the atmosphere. And AMRC will have a new technology component that will enable better measurements at the coastal lines. And that is really important because the coast or beaches is where many people have homes and businesses and property that they want to protect. 
So by better understanding how much uh, the sea levels are rising in those areas and to better predict what the sea level is going to look like in years to come is incredibly valuable. And on a personal note, um, you know, I've been at JPL since 2011. I came straight from school at Georgia Tech where I got my PhD. Um, and most of the missions I've worked on prior to Sentinel-6 were CubeSats, or, um, which are basically these um, miniature satellites about the size of a toaster oven. So if you can imagine, I went from assembling and testing hardware that I could carry by hand uh, to building and testing a single science instrument for an almost bus sized satellite. Um, and you just can't move this size hardware without a crane or a forklift or a semi truck. Um, so the scale was definitely um, very different from my previous missions and certainly introduced some very interesting challenges. Um, but fortunately, I had an amazing team. You know, we took it one day at a time and uh, we were able to successfully deliver AMRC for the project. That is quite the size difference when it comes to moving things around. <laughs> yes. And in the video, you talked about the importance of creativity. How does your love for the arts help you as an engineer? Uh, yes. So I grew up uh, with a love for the arts. I you know, was always singing and dancing and uh, participating in my school talent shows and musicals. So art has been a part of my life um, this entire time. And in recent years, I've been very passionate about sewing. Um, and actually the dress I'm wearing today, I'm not sure if everyone can see the details, um, but I also sewed this one and it's Girls Doing Science. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, every mission is unique. Uh, everything that we build at JPL and NASA is really one of a kind. And, um, and so we're literally inventing every day to make these missions a reality. And you just can't do that without having creativity, without thinking outside the box. And so that's all very important. And I think there's this common misconception that um, the you know arts and science and engineering are just very different fields. You have to pick one or the other. Um, but I see so many parallels in my job. For example, take a sewing pattern and an engineering drawing. They don't look too dissimilar. You know, they're both someone's design um, that has detailed instructions on how to build something, whether that's a dress or a part for a spacecraft. And uh, take the clean room. Uh, there were some shots in the video earlier where you saw engineers and flight technicians at different locations throughout the clean room working on different parts of the spacecraft um, to build these things for space, to build them for our missions. And I see that a lot like a dance on a stage. And as the lead, I am having to think every day about making sure that the right group of people um, with the right skills are at the right spot at the right time to make all of this happen. So I'm effectively choreographing my team on a daily basis to get the job done. So if you, know, you have a creative mind and a passion for space exploration and science, I think JPL and NASA are a great place to be. And I gotta say, I love the dress. And I've always wanted to know, how long does it take to sew a dress from scratch? Um, so it depends a bit on your experience sewing and making sure that you have all the right materials and can dedicate your time. Um, they take me usually a couple of weeks because I'm primarily working on the weekends. Um, but you know, if you could dedicate full, you know, all of your time, it's just a couple of days. Um, but it is funny because, you know, when I was sewing this dress, for example, I got most of the way through and realized I didn't have a zipper uh, that I needed. So I had to quickly go out and make sure I um, got the right uh, zipper to work for this design for this dress pattern. And that happens actually in, you know, space and, and for our, our missions for building and testing, you know, we're human, we make mistakes. Um, we forget things, but uh, that's okay because we're all, you know, dedicated to the mission, dedicated to making it successful, and um, and we just come together and and you know when there's problems we address them and we move forward. That's all about rolling with the punches. So those are my yeah. questions for now. Let's get to some viewer questions. 
So let's start with Gary on YouTube who asks, what would an underwater fault line do to the surf slash water level? Oh, um, that is a good question. Something that I don't think I can directly answer. Um, I would assume that that can definitely impact uh, the sea level heights um, and that a Sentinel-6 would be able to pick something up like that um, with with our science instruments, uh, whether it causes them to increase or decrease. Um, I'm not entirely sure. That's not my, my area of expertise. Um, but, you know, that's why uh, these records are so important, because we need to be able to see uh, how the sea levels are changing over time. And one of my uh, colleagues in a, one of these previous Q and A's talked about, uh, you know, the the valleys and 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 hills of of the water. And that's exactly true. You know, as we're looking throughout the globe, we're seeing you know where the sea levels are are rising and falling throughout the year. Um, but we are absolutely seeing um, a, an increase on an annual basis by about three millimeters. And so. Sea levels are rising and it's really important to have these kinds of missions so we can continue measuring that and, and understanding the impacts. And Udaya on Facebook asks, can we listen to the signals? So I don't think you can listen to the signals, um, the general public. So what uh, we do at NASA and JPL with our missions is we get spectrum licenses for uh, being able to transmit to our satellite so we can talk to it and command it um, for specific, uh, you know, parts of the operation and also to downlink all of that science data. And, um, and those are coordinated on, for specific uh, uh, ground systems, uh, a ground system network uh, around the globe to transmit and collect that data. Um, but, you know, although the general public might not be able to listen to these signals or talk to Sentinel-6, um, we absolutely want to make sure that all of the uh, valuable science data that we have is available to the public. That's great. And uh, Lonnie on Facebook actually has a question about your role, like how many people were on your team? So I had, that's a great question. Um, I had about maybe 15 to 20 people, um, primarily, you know, engineers uh, from the, the disciplines that are really important to our science mission. So electrical engineers, um, mechanical engineers, thermal engineers, um, and also flight technicians. Those are, uh, you know, key as well to our teams. Those are the people that um, usually are the ones working directly with the flight hardware, hands on um, with the nuts and bolts and um, you know, moving the hardware uh, from, from place to place, operating the cranes. Um, so yeah, so those are the types of disciplines that we have on our teams in um, integration and test for our flight missions. And here is some stuff about your dress. It's a big hit online. So let's start with Stella on YouTube who asks, how did you pick your pattern on your dress and what does it mean to you? <laughs> Um, yeah, so, well, this particular dress, you know, uh, girls pursuing their, their dreams and aspirations in science and engineering is, is very important to me. Um, we're still a minority in that, in those disciplines. So, you know, we want to get that ratio up for sure. Um, and, you know, anyone really that is interested in science and engineering and pursuing those dreams, I, I'm very supportive of. I love doing outreach. And uh, when I was actually when I was searching for the space fabric that I had in um, the video, I just happened upon this fabric. Thought, oh, man, this is too cute. Have to get it. Um, and I'll figure out, you know, the pattern for it later. Um, so sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, uh, chance that you, you find these things. And that's what being creative is all about. Sometimes it's just a matter of uh, seeing what you have in front of you and, um, and making something amazing with it. Great. And Kelly Rickerson on Facebook notes, uh, thank you for talking about the intersection between art and science. I am an artist and a longtime science enthusiast. I'm inspired by both fields and love finding new ways for collaboration. Now, Earl on Facebook is, can any aspect of the Sentinel-6 technology be applied to research by a future satellite around Mars? Hmm, that is a great question. So I know that our science instruments are specifically tuned for water. Um, you know, we use radio frequencies 
that are tuned um, to, you know, the, the frequencies that are going to detect uh, water vapor and precipitation and moisture. Um, so it's, it's absolutely possible that these types of instruments can be used on um, other missions, whether at Mars or some of our other, you know, deep space missions, radars and radiometers um, and GPS, you know, all of the science instruments that we have on Sentinel-6 are certainly key to, to um, completing science uh, missions at other planets. They just might be tweaked, uh, you know, to that particular mission and what uh, the scientists want to measure there. And Shivani on YouTube, says um, that they love your dress. They just want to let you know, too. <laughs> now, well, thank we, you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a big hit. Ahmed on <laughs> Facebook asks, what are the potential risks of this mission? Um, well, I don't know if there's any risk, per se, uh, to flying uh, Sentinel-6. Um, you know, we've been flying uh, this type of satellite since the early 90s, so we've absolutely uh, learned a lot through um, out that throughout that time, almost 30 years now. And we're also going back to the same orbit uh, with same inclination. That was actually really important because when we take these measurements um, and we have this long record, we want to make sure um, that we're comparing apples to apples, as they say. Um, you know, so if we were at a different orbit, maybe a different inclination, um, you know, we'd still be collecting similar data, but maybe not um, couldn't trust that it was exactly apples to apples. Um, so we are going to the same orbit and um, just continuing this mission. So I think it's it's very low risk um, and I'm really excited to see it launch later this month. And then Brian on YouTube asks, will the data used you collect, will it be shared with the public? Yes, absolutely. So there is some processing that we need to do uh, once we get it down to the ground. Um, and uh, uh, but the the intent for sure in the long term is to make it publicly available. Um, and um, actually, our project manager, Parag Vaze, um, who had a Q&A session a couple weeks ago, shared uh, some of the really interesting applications that other people have used. Sentinel-6 is specifically looking at our oceans and measuring ocean heights, um, but that data can be used uh, for many other things. Um, he mentioned one of the most interesting ones was um, people actually looking for the Malaysian airliner that went down a few years ago. And so um, it's just it's really interesting to see how when you make this data publicly available, um, what kind of applications there are. And uh, so Sentinel-6 will focus on our ocean um, heights and continuing that observation. But the data will be available to the public and, and used in many exciting ways. Wow. I didn't know that about the data. So Rose Centaur on YouTube wants to know, did you encounter any major lessons or challenges based on differences between the CubeSat and a large flight mission? Um, yes, well, you know, flight hardware is flight hardware. Uh, we, it's always very valuable and, um, and we test it in very similar ways. Uh, we always test to make sure that um, this hardware can survive the the rigors of of space and launch um so i actually yeah had a an incident uh not an incident but something that came up in sentinel six with amrc um that was uh, just kind of a funny story we were in the middle of our thermal vacuum test and so that's when we take our hardware and we put it into a thermal vacuum chamber and we simulate the extreme temperatures and vacuum of space that the uh, flight hardware will see throughout its mission. And that's where we really, you know, test the hardware and we really um, put it through the ringer to make sure that it's going to operate the way that we need it to throughout the mission. Um, and uh, and that's a, when we run those tests, they're run, uh, you know, all the time. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week until the test is done. And when um, we were in the middle of the test for AMRC, I was on call and I get a, a phone call from one of my uh, engineers saying uh, one of the computers crashed. And I was like, OK, well, first thing, don't panic. Um, second thing, um, you know, is the is the hardware safe? That's the other key thing, you know, outside of making sure that our people are safe, we got to make sure our flight hardware is safe. Um, and so we checked everything. Uh, hardware was safe. Um, and there were no issues. So then, okay, well now let's try to get this computer back online. 
Um, and I kid you not, um, as my engineer was calling me to let me know that the computer is back online and everything looks good, he goes, oh no, it crashed again. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, all right, let's do this again. Don't panic. Make sure the instrument is safe. Make sure AMRC is safe. Um, and at that point we said, okay, we can't trust this computer. We need to get our, our backup in. And so that was a big, um, you know, lesson that, oh my, plan B, always, you know, have a contingency plan, have backups as much as you can. Um, and so fortunately we did have another computer that was backed up, ready to go if we had any problems. And, um, and we got that one up and running and um, didn't have a, a problem with the computer after that. But you know, you you try so hard to plan uh, for these uh, these missions and um, this work, and you try to think about all the ways something can go wrong. But we're human, and 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 something's going to happen. And you know, a computer just dying on you, a computer that was not even a year old and was working fine, you know, weeks before to just crash on you in the middle of this very big test um, was a bit stressful. But, uh, but that's why we plan and that's why we have, uh, you know, backups so that we can, um, you know, quickly adjust and carry on. And turns out we have some eagle eye viewers watching. Lexigon on YouTube asks, are those Harry Potter books behind Shannon? If so, <laughs> what house does she belong to? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Those are Harry Potter books. Good eye. Um, and um, I guess I would go with Gryffindor. Maybe that's um, obvious, but I felt like I always related with uh, the Gryffindor house. Ah, let's see. What about everyone at home? What house are you? I'd like to know as well. And uh, Chrissy on Facebook asks, why is it important that we study Earth? Why not just focus on space missions and Mars? That is a great question. Um, and I'll say first that, hey, Earth is our home. It's the only home we have right now. Um, and there's so much about it that we just don't fully understand yet. Um, and it's changing, it's evolving. And um, we, you know, sometimes in ways we can't even predict. So it is very important to NASA and JPL to continue these Earth science missions to fully understand um, our world and how it's changing and to better predict how it might change in the future um, so that we can be good custodians of this planet. Um, and so, you know, obviously space exploration and um, exploring Mars and Jupiter and uh, other places of our solar system are very important to, to NASA and JPL, um, but we also wanna make sure we keep an eye on, on our home, on our planet. Can't forget Earth. Uh, Shivani on YouTube asks, can you discuss a bit more about your role on the Advisory Council for Women at JPL? Oh, yes. Um, so the Advisory Council for Women is an employee resource group at JPL. Uh, we have a couple of employee resource groups, um, mainly for minorities um, at JPL. And, um, and the Advisory Council for Women is specifically for women and our allies at JPL. And we tend to just have host events um, where uh, we can network and meet each other and support each other. I mentioned earlier that making sure that you have um, like a support network um, is, is really key to being successful. And, um, and of course, women in engineering um, and science is also something very important to me and something that I wanna encourage. And uh, being a part of ACW is allowing me to contribute there um, at JPL. And Pablo on Facebook wants to know, is there a next project after Sentinel-6? Well, for me personally, um, I'm actually uh, now a group supervisor at uh, JPL. Um, so I'm, I'm managing other people that are working on these great projects. Um, and I specifically am overseeing our environmental test laboratory, um, the dynamics testing. So I mentioned thermal vacuum testing where we put our spacecraft under temperature and vacuum extremes uh, to simulate space. On the dynamic side, we actually simulate launch. Um, and if anyone has ever seen a launch, it is quite, um, it's very exciting and, um, and it's, it's a, a bumpy ride. <laughs> it's a bumpy ride to space. Um, and it's so important that uh, we test our hardware to make sure that it's going to survive that ride to space because if we can't even 
get um, off the ground, then we, we have no chance in having a successful mission. So my group is specifically responsible for running the facilities and testing the flight hardware under uh, those uh, launch conditions. Great. And then I have time for one more question. And this is actually going to get a bit into your background and a little bit of advice. Joe from London, we're international here on Facebook, asks, what would be the best way to support my seven-year-old daughter to get into science more? She is doing coding clubs and et cetera, but what's the best way to support her? Likewise, my five-year-old son, are there some online programs that you like or that you have at JPL? Uh, yes. Well, I would say the first thing is to continue to support them. Um, there is nothing um, better than than knowing that you have the, the support from your family um, to empower you and enable you to uh, pursue your dreams. And, um, and, you know, JPL actually has a lot of great educational resources online. So I highly recommend checking out jpl.nasa.gov. Um, to see all the great things we have for um, education and outreach. And uh, for me personally, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, so I wasn't too far away from Kennedy Space Center. Unfortunately, got to see a uh, space shuttle launch when I was in fourth grade, which was very exciting. Um, but actually working for NASA one day was never uh, something I thought about uh, growing up. It was something that was really inspiring um, and uh, amazing, but something out of reach for me. Uh, my parents actually didn't go to college. I'm the first one in my immediate family to graduate with a college degree. Um, so it's a bit of a surprise to all of us that I'm, I'm here today. Um, but, but, you know, they always supported me. They always encouraged me to, you know, to, to go after what I wanted. Um, and, you know, even when I had these challenging uh, classes um, or professors, they, you know, they just kept telling me, nope, you can do it. Yeah, you've got this. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, just pushing through, uh, showing up every day and keeping your eye on the prize, keeping your eye on the long term goals um, is really key. And um, it's not easy. You know, uh, you don't have to necessarily be a math whiz. Uh, to be an engineer or to be in science. Um, I know that might be also a misconception, um, but you know, there's going to be challenging times. And, uh, and I personally struggled a bit in some of my classes, some of my math and science classes, but it was just key to, you know, keep showing up every day, uh, pushing through it, have the support from your uh, classmates, from your family, um, and to the father, you know, just always be there, always be there to support them and encourage them, uh, especially on the days that are more challenging than others. Great. That is all the time for questions we have today. Thank you for your questions. And thank you so much for joining us today, Shannon. Oh, thank you so much. It's been great. And I really appreciate everyone's questions and time. Great. The Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite is a true international collaboration. It is being jointly developed by the European Space Agency, NASA, the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, with funding support from the European Commission and technical support from the French Space Agency, CNES. The Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite is now scheduled to launch on November 21st. For the latest on the mission, follow at NASA Earth on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also watch all of the behind the spacecraft video profiles on the NASA 360 YouTube channel. We've been doing Q&As with the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite team members for the past few weeks. Check out all of the episodes on the NASA JPL YouTube channel, and you can follow and subscribe for notifications. At NASA Earth Science, your home is our mission. Thanks for watching.